Today, we are going to study about two important phenomena of ecology called mutualism and commensalism as a part of biotic interactions. Let us have an introductory idea about different kinds of symbiotic relationships commonly observed in nature. Under natural conditions, all the living organisms of ecosystem influence the life of each other directly or indirectly. In nature, organisms are very much dependent on the intraspecific and interspecific interactions for carrying out various vital processes of life such as growth, nutrition and reproduction. This type of biotic interactions may be for the whole life or temporary. Most of the ecologists use the term symbiosis for biotic interactions which literally means living together. Clark in the year 1954 restricts the use of the term symbiosis only for such type of interactions which are mutually beneficial and where one or both the species are benefited and neither is harmed. Odom in the year 1971 used the term in its broader sense and divided all types of symbiotic relationships into two groups, namely positive interactions and negative interactions. Association between two species which result in positive effect are exceedingly widespread and very much significant in determining the nature of populations and communities. Positive interactions are those interactions where population help one another, the interaction being either one way or reciprocal. In this kind of interactions, either one or both the species are benefited. This benefit may be in respect of obtaining the food, shelter, transport or protection. These include mutualism, commensalism and proto-cooperation. In this particular lecture, we will mainly focus on different aspects of mutualism and commensalism. Let us start with mutualism first. Mutualism is a kind of symbiotic relationship between individuals of different species in which both individuals benefit from the association. Mutualism is a common phenomenon found in nature which plays a key role in maintaining the ecological integrity of the biosphere. Mutualism has apparently made important contribution to the evolutionary history of life. Mutually beneficial interspecific interactions are usually found in tropic regions. The more realistic picture of ecosystem reveals that the need for mutualism increases with decreased resource availability and mutualism are most frequently in stressful habitats. In mutualism, two species interact in such a way that both the partners are benefited. So, it is also referred to as win-win relationships. Mutualism can be differentiated into two types on the basis of closeness of the association between two species. First, that is facultative mutualism. In this relationship, both organisms benefit by living in close association, but the relation is not essential. The species can live without its mutualistic partner and so relationship is called facultative mutualism. The second one is obligate mutualism. As the name implies, in this type of association, an obligatory contact exists between different organisms. It involves a close and permanent contact between two organisms. In this case, the other species is so dependent upon the mutualistic relationship that it cannot live in the absence of its mutualistic partner. This relationship is essential for the survival of both the organisms and two population enter into some sort of physiological exchange. Now, let's have a look at different types of mutualistic relationships on the basis of service and resource procurement. Mutualism can also be thought of as a form of biological barter since the species trade resources like nutrients or services such as gamete or pollen dispersal or 
protection from predators. Depending on this, mutualistic relationships can be of three types. First, that is resource-resource relationships. In this type of relationship, one type of resource is traded for a different resource. Most common form of this mutualistic relationship include mycorrhizal associations between plant roots and fungi as well as nitrogen fixing bacteria and leguminous plant. Second, that is service resource relationships. Service resource relationships are quite common in nature. One of the nice examples of it is pollination, in which resources like pollen from plants are traded for service like pollen dispersal by various animals. Third, that is service service relationships. Strict service service interactions are very rarely found. One example is that of the relationship between ants in the genus Pseudomyremix and trees in the genus Acacia, in which, in exchange for food and shelter, ants protect Acacias from attack by herbivores. Now, let us have a detailed overview of various types of mutualistic symbiotic relationships categorized on the basis of functional aspect. Many mutualistic symbiotic relationships have been documented so far. Let us classify mutualism on the basis of functional approach by taking examples of different type of mutualistic association one by one. Let us start with pollination symbiosis. Pollination mutualism between flowering plants and animals such as insects like bees, moths, butterflies, etc. and birds as well as bat is one of the most common form of mutualism. They derive food from nectar, pollen or other plant products and in return bring about cross-pollination. To ensure the success of this function, various structural adaptations have occurred in both plants and animals leading to co-evolution. The second type of mutualism is transport symbiosis. Birds and mammals are of great importance as the distributing agents of various parts of plants. Many times seeds, fruits or even entire plants become attached to the feathers or fur or ingested seeds are eliminated unharmed along with the faces by animals and distributed in the environment from one place to the other. One of the main mutualistic relationship observed in nature is nutritional symbiosis. Some species benefit from nutritional mutualism. Lichens, hardy species that grow on trees or barren rocks, consist of colorful photosynthetic algae and chlorophyll lacking fungi living together. The fungi provide a home for the algae. Not only this, their bodies collect and hold moisture and mineral nutrients which are made available to the algae for carrying out photosynthesis. The algae provide sugars as food to the fungi. In nature, neither of the two can grow alone independently. Thus, lichens form the example of mutualism where contact is close and permanent as well as obligatory. Another example of nutritional symbiosis observed in 90% of terrestrial plant community in the highly specialized fungi that combine with plant roots to form mycorrhizal association. Mycorrhizae make substantial contribution to plant performance by using their myriad networks of hair-like extensions to improve the plant's ability to extract nutrients and water from the soil. The relationship is critical in nutrient deficient soil with the fungi aiding in the absorption of the nutrients especially phosphorus and nitrogenous compounds. The fungi also help the plant in defending its against pathogen invasion by preventing carbohydrates from leaching out through the root thus attracting potential invaders. In turn, the fungi get nutrition from the plant's root. The association between reef-building corals and zooxanthellae 
is functionally similar to the relationship between plants and mycorrhizal fungi. Zooxanthellae live within coral tissues and receive nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus from their animal partner which are considered as scarce resources in tropical seas. In return, coral receives organic compounds synthesized by zooxanthellae during photosynthesis. Mutualistic relationship can also be distinguished as nutritional and shelter symbiosis. One of the best examples of mutualism that combines nutritional and shelter symbiosis is the association between rhizobium bacteria and leguminous family plants. In case of symbiotic nitrogen fixation, a bacterium rhizobium forms nodules in the roots of leguminous plants and lives symbiotically with the host. Bacteria get the protective space to live in and derive prepared food from the roots of higher plants and in return fix gaseous nitrogen making it available to plants. The leguminous plants use this nitrogen in the protein synthesis and so legumes are rich in proteins. Nitrogen fixation like association also occurs in root nodules of the alnus, allopecurus, casuarina, cycadaceas, myrica, podocarpus, etc. and leaves of about 400 species of non-leguminous plants. Not only this, some unicellular photosynthetic algae known as zooxanthellae live symbiotically in the outer tissues of certain sponges, cylindrates, mollusk and worms. Algae are photosynthetic and produce oxygen and other compounds beneficial to the host and in exchange they obtain materials such as carbon dioxide and nitrogenous wastes released by metabolism of host animals. One of the most often cited examples of interspecific mutualism is the protozoa that live in the gut of termites. The flagellate protozoan trichonympha is an obligate anaerobe found in the hind gut of several species of wood eating termites. Although termites can physically chew and ingest wood, they are incapable of chemically digesting cellulose into sugars. The termite reduce the wood to small fragments passing them through the alimentary canal to hen gut where the protozoans digest the cellulose changing it into sugar. Without this protozoa, the termite would be unable to digest the cellulose. The protozoa in return are provided with food, shelter, and aerobic conditions and a means of transportation for dispersal. The protozoans and termites exhibit obligative mutualism, a strict interdependency in which neither partner can survive under natural conditions without the other. In case of gut inhabitant mutualism, vast armies of organisms live in an animal's digestive tract. For example, certain kind of bacteria lives in the intestines of humans. Humans cannot digest all of the food eaten by them. The bacteria eat the food that the human cannot digest and partially digest it, allowing human to finish the job. The bacteria benefit by getting food and shelter and in turn they help digest their host food. Another aspect of mutualistic relationship is nutritional and defensive symbiosis. A mutualistic system of defense has been achieved by the Acacia cornigera and their ant inhabitants. The Shudomyrimex species of ants depend on Acacia tree for obtaining food as well as habitat and acacia depends on the ants for protection from herbivores and neighboring plants. This species of acacia possess large hollow thorns in which ants live. The ants feed on modified leaflet tips called Baltian bodies which are the primary source of protein and oil for the ants and also on enlarged nectaries which supply sugars. Swollen thorn acacias maintain year-around leaf production even in the dry season 
to provide food for the ants. The acacia ants continually patrol the leaves and branches of the tree and immediately attack any herbivore that attempts to eat acacia leaves or bark. Some of the species of ants that inhabit acacia thorns are obligate acacia ants and live nowhere else. Another example of mutualism is found between aphids and ants. Many ants are found in the vicinity of aphids. The ants feed on the sugary fluid released by the aphids and the aphids are protected by the ants. One more example of a mutualistic relationship which combines nutrition and protection is that of the oxpecker bird and large thick skinned animals like African buffalo, elephants, rhinoceros or zebras. Oxpecker ride on the back of these animals and eat ticks and other parasites that live on their skin. The oxpeckers get food and the beast get pest control. Also, when predators approach, the oxpeckers fly upward and scream a warning which helps the symbiont. At last, shelter and defensive symbiosis type of mutualism is also observed in nature. Spider crabs live in shallow areas of the ocean floor and greenish brown algae lives on the crab's back making the crabs blend in with its environment and unnoticeable to predators. The algae get a good place to live and the crabs get camouflage. Let us now move on to the study of commensalism as another type of positive symbiotic interaction. In ecology, commensalism is a class of symbiotic relationship between two organisms of different species in which one organism derives some benefit while the other is neither benefited nor harmed. Commensalism is an ecological relationship which occur in both plant and animal kingdoms and is also prevalent among bacterial species. Commensalism derives from the English word commensal literally meaning sharing of food in human social interaction which in turn derives from the medieval Latin commensalis meaning sharing a table from the prefix com meaning together and mensa meaning table or meal. Commensalism is a species interaction that benefits one species but has little if any effect on the other species. Commensalism can also be referred to as do not harm relationships. In this association the commensal benefits and the host is apparently unaffected. The commensal may obtain nutrients, shelter, support or locomotion from the host species which is substantially unaffected. Often the host species provides a home and or transportation for the other species. Like all ecological interactions, commensalisms vary in strength and duration from intimate, long-lived symbiosis to brief, weak interactions through intermediates. Now let us have a glimpse of different type of commensal relationships noticed in nature. There are several distinct types of commensal relationships that can be explained. Most recognized functional form of commensalism include chemical, inquilinism, metabiosis and foracy. To get more realistic picture, let us learn about the commensal relationship in detail by taking certain examples of it. We have already discussed that commensalism is a relationship between two species where one species derives a benefit from the relationship and the second species remains unaffected. Let us understand how species interact so that one benefits but the other is not harmed. There are numerous interesting examples of commensalism spanning ecoregions of both terrestrial and aquatic realms. Let us look at several examples of commensalism which serve to identify a few 
representative classes of such interaction one by one. Let us start with liners. These are vascular plants commonly found in dense forest of moist tropical climates. They are rooted in the ground and maintain erectness of their stems by making use of another objects for support. Common liners are species of Bahuinia, Ficus and Tinospora. Thus, with much economy of mechanical tissues, liners are able to get better light without causing any harm to the host. Commensalism can be best understood by taking the example of epiphytes. Epiphytes are the group of plant species growing perched on other plants. Epiphytes may grow on trees, shrubs or larger submerged plants. They use other plants only as support and not for water or food supply. In epiphytes, there is a special layer velamen over the root surface. The cells of the velamen are whitish which can take up abundant water rapidly from the atmosphere. Orchid is a well known example of the epiphytic plant that grows on the branches or trunks of other trees for support without any harm or benefit to the tree. The epiphyte obtains more light and air in this manner. Let's take the example of some epizoans to understand commensalism. Some plants grow on the surfaces of animals. For example, green algae grow on long grooved hairs of the sloth. Similarly, basicladia grows on the backs of freshwater turtles. Some commensal as oyster crab, pinotheros ostricum, is found in mantle cavity of the oysters. In addition to shelter, it also gets food from the host mollusk oyster without causing any harm. Some as Treponema macrodentium, living in mouth and entamoeba coli in intestine of men are harmless commensals. There are several commensals that make temporary contact with other organisms. For example, squirrels, monkeys, tree frogs, snakes, birds, insects, etc. use trees and other plants for substratum, shelter or breeding sites. The best explanation of commensalism can be given by describing the relationship between anemones and clownfish. There is a commensal relationship between some tropical sea anemones and certain small fishes called clownfishes. Clownfishes are a beautiful group of tropical reef fishes from the Pacific and Indian Oceans. These fishes have a close relationship with sea anemones. The structure of the sea anemone consists of a hollow cylinder surrounded by a crown of tentacles. The tentacles are equipped with specialized cells called nematocysts. Nematocysts are shaped and function like small harpoons and contain a poison sufficient to paralyze or kill small fish and other reef inhabitants. Clownfishes live within the waving mass of tentacles of sea anemones. Because most fishes avoid poisonous tentacles, the clownfishes are protected from their predators. Another nice example of commensalism is of barnacles and whales. Barnacles are the sedentary crustaceans that is they cannot move on their own. They may attach themselves to more mobile marine organisms. At their larval stage they stick to the bodies of other organisms like whales and other places like shells, rocks or even ships and grow on their surface. As the whales move about, the barnacles find new habitats where food might be available. While the whales are on the move, the barnacles catch hold of floating plankton and other food material using their feather like feet. In this way, barnacles obtain the nutrition as well as transportation and the whale is not harmed or benefited in any manner. 
One of the most popular examples of commensalism is the relationship between cattle egrets and livestock. Cattle egrets are foraging in fields among cattle or other livestock. As cattle, horses and other livestock graze on the field, they cause movement that stir up various insects. As the insects are stirred up, the cattle egrets following the livestock catch and feed upon them. The egrets benefit from their relationship because the livestock have helped them find their meals while the livestock are typically unaffected by it. Another interesting example of commensal relationship is that of remora fish and sharks. Remora is a small sucker fish belonging to a family of ray finned fish. It forms a special relationship with sharks and other sea organisms like whales and turtles. The dorsal fin of the remora is modified to form a sucker. It attaches itself to the bodies of sharks with the help of this sucker and uses the shark for transportation as well as protection from its predators. It also eats up the scraps of food that are left over when the shark eats its prey. In this manner, the remora fish forms a commensal relationship with sharks and does not in any manner harm or benefit them. Pseudoscorpions and beetles also show commensal relationship. Pseudoscorpions are scorpion-like insects that do not have stingers. Some species of the pseudoscorpions hide themselves under the wing covers of large insects like beetles. This gives them protection from their predators and also provides them a means of transportation over a larger area. Because of its small size and lack of sting, it does not harm the beetle in any way. The example of monarch butterfly and milkweed also provides an idea about commensalism. The monarch butterfly is a well-known type of butterfly that is found very commonly in the North American region. At their larval stage, the monarch forms a commensal relationship with certain species of milkweeds. The milkweeds contain a poisonous chemical known as cardiac glycoside, which is harmful to almost all vertebrates. The monarch stores these poisonous chemicals in its body throughout its lifespan. When a bird eats a monarch butterfly, it finds it distasteful and gets sick. Thus, birds and other predators avoid eating the monarch. In this way, the monarch butterfly benefits from the milkweeds without affecting them. Another example of commensalism is the bird following army ends. Many birds form a commensal relationship with some species of ants like the army ants. A great number of army ants trail on the forest floor and while moving stir up many insects lying in their path. The birds follow these army ants and eat up the insects that try to escape from them. The birds benefit by catching their prey easily while the army ants are totally unaffected. One of the easiest examples of commensalism is of burdock seed on the fur of passing animals. Many plant species like burdocks, weeds mostly found along roadsides and on barren land have adapted themselves by developing curved spines on their seeds or seed pods in order to disperse them over a large area. They easily catch onto the fur of passing animals which carry and drop off these seeds to other regions. In this way, this commensal relationship ensures the proper disposal of burdock seeds while the animals remain unharmed. Emperor shrimp and sea cucumbers also constitute nice example of commensal relationship. Emperor shrimp is a small crustacean that is usually found in the Indo-Pacific regions. It can be seen hitching a ride on sea cucumbers. These shrimp get protection as well as a mode of transportation 
to move about in larger areas in search of food without spending any energy on their own. They get off from their host sea cucumber to feed and get back on for a ride when they want to move to another area. Last example of commensalism is that of redwood sorrel and trees. Redwood sorrel is a small herb which benefits from growing in the shade of tall redwood trees with no known negative effects on the redwood trees. Regarding commensalism, some biologists argue that in nature there exist certain situations where we find some hetero not mentioned associations in which it is difficult to prove whether the interaction is totally neutral to the host or not. For instance, one of such example includes epiphytes. Large number of epiphytes can also cause tree limbs to break or shade the host plant and reduce its rate of photosynthesis. Similarly, phoretic mites may hinder their host by making flight more difficult which may affect its aerial hunting ability. Thus, whether the situation mentioned here may belong to commensalism or not is still unanswered. Many more examples of mutualism and commensalism are being discovered each year as men delves deeper in the quest of solving the still unsolved mysteries of nature. In this particular lecture of ecology, we have learned two important phenomena of nature called mutualism and commensalism as a part of positive symbiotic interactions. Initially, we have gathered the information about general meaning of mutualism, then we have classified it into facultative and obligatory mutualism. We have also described its types based on service resource relationship. Not only this, to get more realistic picture of mutualism, depending on its functional aspect, we have discussed numerous examples of this type of mutualistic relationships which are commonly observed in nature. During second half of this lecture, we have got an overview of commensalism with its types in terms of chemical, inquilinism, metabiosis and phoracy. We have also described certain peculiar examples of commensalism to get a more detailed knowledge about the concept. And all the examples of mutualism and commensalism discussed in this program provide the evidence of the extent to which some living organisms can evolve or adapt in order to survive. Thank you.